Thank you for watching, liking, commenting, sharing, and subscribing right now. Because I'm a geek. Robert's a geek. A lot of us in here are geeks, certainly technologically minded. And even if we're not, technology is becoming increasingly pervasive. I've been saying that for years. But it's accelerating to the point where human circuitry is becoming real. Uh, as the schedule unfolded, if there's a theme that is in this schedule, it's that you have the power to change the world. And all you need is a phone. And you can change the world. You don't need much. You don't have to wait for somebody else to tell you what to do. When you're inspired, when you interact, when a path is illuminated, when technology allows you to have these connections with the world, with humanity. Um, so uh, the theme, overarching theme, and if I believe if, if, if there was one, it's the power of the individual. You have the power. Thank God that's not a Vivuzella. Which, by the way, we're all mature, right? I would, I would use those sparingly. So, you know, in terms of changing the world, I, I, I was inspired uh, by uh, an individual. He, he actually came up with the idea. John Kelly, a genius when it comes to looking at statistics and how they're relative. Um, in, instead of talking about the Iranian blogosphere, his company, uh, a private enterprise, ended up mapping it and, and showing that there's different parts of an Iranian blogosphere and how the spheres influence each other. Um, and so he came up with an idea of star tags. So the idea is, and this, this was tweeted out on August 5th, let's start rating our tweets. And I've got some examples here. And so I'm going to plant a seed. I, I don't know how far it's going to go. I don't know if it's going to go anywhere. But Twitter's got hashtags. John Kelly has come up with the idea of star tags. So a couple of examples here that may be difficult to see. I've got, I think, slightly better examples here. I can't believe the Rick Roll Sushi at Hotel Max is so good, star nine. So you're not rating the tweet, you're rating what you're tweeting about. Is it just me, or is at and service in Bell Harbor really bad in the hallway, star two? Star zero, bad. Star nine, good. I don't think the idea of star tags will ever take off, star zero. <laughs> Inception would have been better with Abe Vigoda in the leading role, star six. I still don't know if I've seen that movie or not. I don't know if that was a dream. <laughs> Sorry, very meta. So, <laughs> you get it, sir. You get it. You get it. That's the idea. So from this, John, in, in, in his efforts with his company, gleans information from information we're already putting out there about ourselves, about, uh, about data. The movie industry can now predict with 99 seven or percent, some wild number, w accuracy on whether a movie's gonna be successful based on how Twitter reacts to the movie, or if it does or if it doesn't. So there's metadata that we're putting out there, so why not just take it a little step further? Like, if I'm tweeting about Hotel Max, you know, if, is it a good tweet, is it a bad tweet? So maybe adding a star nine would allow someone to scrape the tweets, maybe officially in some API form at some point, and gather more analysis about information, just with two characters, star and a single digit. That's the idea. I don't know, it's, it's not my idea, I just thought it was worth sharing. So you can do with it what you want, you can do it here, you can tweet it out and see if it'll take off, you could write it up, try to explain it better than I did. I don't know. So here's the present. Some people buy, like Josh, a longtime known Dexter up here from Portland, representing, uh, buys his Gnome Dex ticket before the schedule's announced. It's a very difficult thing to <laughs> sell to someone who's never been to Gnome Dex. Because the bottom line is it's not so much what's happening here, it's the interplay of what's happening here with what's, what's happening there. So the audience is as much a part of this conference as the presenters on stage. But the bottom line is Gnome Dex is what you make it. We, we've set the stage to try to make it as, as, as a good a conference as possible. 
keeping it to a single track event, making sure you got food, beverages, good coffee, uh, hopefully. I don't know if you tried the Smart Cup stuff. Um, power, and by the way, the last two rows, we're, we're working on getting uh, uh, power strips back there. There was a, uh, <laughs> at a conference center, you pay for everything. Uh, <laughs> so we're doing our best. But it is, I, I believe, uh, in your head, uh, that's, that's what makes or breaks the conference. But it's what you make it. I took an open source project that Google acquired, well actually it wasn't open source before Google acquired, they acquired it, uh, called Etherpad. Uh, they acquired the team and the technology to integrate within Google Wave, rest in peace. Um, <laughs> Etherpad was wonderful, wonderful, easy, dynamic, live collaboration. And so I registered a domain, typewith.me. Uh, educational institutions have been using it. Uh, certain other conferences have used it. If you want to take notes, you, you may be better off doing it in a collaborative fashion because someone may say something, you want to jot it down. Um, I'm very careful not to tweet anything about a specific type with me document because I have a lot of trolls who follow me. <laughs> so if you're thinking about collaboration or note taking, uh, you may consider using the, this open source project. If you're asking about a hashtag, pound gnomedex, I'm sorry, hash gnomedex is fine. Some people will use gnomedex2010, but Honestly, hashtag Gnomedex is, is, is perfect. Um, this is uh, another thing I want to uh, remind everybody about. It wasn't clearly communicated last year, but uh, if you parked over across the way, we can get you a slight discount for parking, get a voucher out, uh, I think at registration or somewhere out there. Um, I think $10, and we're pretty much cutting it to cost. Like, it, it would normally be you know, more than that if you're parking there all day. So we're trying to save you money, not making anything from it. What's that? No, 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 you pay when you leave. I don't know where you park, but this is specifically for the garage over across the street. <laughs> you can move your car too, I mean, we'll have breaks. Uh, live video feed is on gnomedex.com. Now there are some conference producers who will charge for a live video feed or even the recorded videos. I don't believe in that, never have. Um, I, I think it, it's just goodwill to the community and I also have said the same thing for years. Whatever you guys record, photo, upload, I don't care. It's not going to go through some screening process. What happens at Gnomedex stays with the world. So just be, <laughs> just be very mindful that, you know, taking someone's photo, uh, it's cool usually, but make sure you get permission. Some people don't want to be photographed. They're not comfortable with cameras. I, I don't think that's an issue here, uh, but you never know. Uh, another thing that's happened in years past uh, when there's been uh, something happening on stage and people are kind of empowered and they feel like they want to band together and help whatever efforts on stage, they'll pass around a hat and collect money. Let's try not to do that because it just creates this awkward you know, moment for someone who's like, well, I wasn't going to donate, but then they feel a pressure to donate. So if you're going to do it, make the gesture online, do it personally, and that's fine, but let's not apply any kind of social pressure to, to people in the room. Uh, another thing I want to note, uh, the ha there's a hackathon on Sunday at uh, the Edgewater, uh, like right across the, the way, just right around the corner. And uh, the future of Gnomedex, it is true. This is it. Uh, sorry, can't do it again. Uh, it's, it's really more a labor of love than anything else, and without key partnerships in places in a company that will do it, <laughs> uh, it's not going to happen. So 10's a nice round number. Uh, I may do workshops, seminars, day events, do a Seattle Geek Week again if there's interest from the community, getting everybody on the same page. I do think, uh, I do think we could do a, uh, a Seattle Geek Week uh, like food geeks or you know, wine geeks. I think there are a lot of different types of geeks, so not just for tech stuff. Uh, but again, open to uh, future event partnerships, but uh, as far as Gnomedex is concerned, this is, enjoy it. This, as far as this is, it's not happening again. Don't be sad, because Gnomedex is you, and you're going to carry it with you wherever you go, in everything that you do. Hopefully, uh, something will spark your attention and make you realize that you do have the power uh, to do things, to change the world. Um, now, uh, I'm not going to, I think I'm running a little over, so I'm going to skip a couple of uh, uh, other announcements at the moment because I think I got everything uh, pretty much covered, other than, real quickly, 
mom, my mom, my parents, who have been staples for Gnome decks uh, for pretty much all 10 years, has collected a scrapbook of all 10 Gnome decks memorabilia. Uh, and Beth Goza, who has been coming to Gnome decks since 2002, <laughs> framed her Gnome decks 2002 poster. <laughs> kind of nice. Thank you, Beth. Uh, sorry about that, Beth. Um, the, uh, and, and outside the front door, uh, you saw some uh, paper, uh, like whiteboards. We're going to do kind of a bar camp style thing. Like if you had 10 minutes to spend on stage, what would you talk about? Uh, don't write your name on there. I'm not interested in the names. I'm interested in ideas. Uh, and then we'll kind of go through it. And when we have an extra hour here in the day in the schedule, uh, we'll have some of you on stage. So uh, I guess with that, could you go ahead and turn that off? Um, thank you. Sorry, I'm gonna. That's not live. I'm just switching over to our keynote presenter's keynote presentation. Um, Brian Solis uh, has been coming to Gnome Decks for a variety of years, or a number of years, and so I guess I've known Brian for a lot longer than most people have known Brian, which is cool. Um, and so it, it really didn't take much for me to recognize that Brian's really been doing good things and inspiring a lot of people. Um, and, and that's, to me, that's, that's good Gnome Dex keynote material. And so if you're in the world of social media, I would be surprised if you didn't know who Brian was, because if you didn't, then you're not in social media. Uh, it's true. It's very true. And so... Uh, I was very grateful when uh, Brian decided to fly, I think, you, somewhere in South America? Brazil, all the way to Seattle to uh, do Gnome Dex. That was a, an honor. And so it is an honor to welcome Brian on stage to uh, give us a good uh, kickoff for Gnome Dex 10. Brian? Yeah. Well, good morning. Uh, I have to say that um, this is actually uh, a real big emotional uh, experience for me. I have uh, been coming to Gnome Dex for a long time uh, as an attendee, as a paid attendee, because it was the only conference that I felt every year that I could get value, that I could learn something from not just the people on stage, but everybody here, uh, from the conference to the, the drinking, <laughs> the late nights. Uh, I always walked away with something really special, and so I wanted to talk a little bit today about what Gnome Dex means to me, what I take away from Gnome Dex, and also as an homage to all that Chris has done for all of us. Over the years, I tried to document everything I could, both you know, in my mind, in blogs, in tweets, through pictures, but if the elite have TED, the geeks have Gnome Dex. And this is, this is our moment. This is a real wonderful time in history where we can actually define what happens here in the future. And so some of these pictures here are moments that I just can't forget. And I have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these, and I won't go through them all this morning. But what this really is about is you and me. And what the web is doing is not just allowing us to communicate. It's not just allowing us to tweet our thoughts or experiences. We're actually defining a whole new era of society. As Chris calls it, the human circuitry. As Cisco calls it, the human network. We're actually building something that, as Chris calls it, the narcissism. <laughs> <laughs> or as I call it, the ego system. How many of you guys have heard of this movie, We Live in Public? Yeah, Josh Harris's very awesome experiment, showing us what's possible when we become the stars of our own reality series, because that's what's happening. And so for those who know Jeff Jarvis, he's writing a book about privacy and publicness, and how privacy is now scarce, and publicness is now abundant. And so for you in the room, I'm actually speaking, hopefully, at the same time through you, to the people who are connected with you, because you're here for many reasons. One of the reasons I'm here is to help educate those around us and help them educate those around them who are using the web, who are not quite realizing the true power that's at their fingertips. 
With everything we do, we cast this idea of digital shadows, right? Every post, every tweet, every picture, every flip video that you film of yourself, like the Blair Witch effect, where it's just completely shaking and people aren't quite sure what they're watching. Those things are there for everyone to see. And they're there for everyone to find. Good humor slides there. <laughs> he took it literally. <laughs> but then we complain, not we, maybe some of us, but those that we know, or those that we read about, those who are in the news, sensationalists, how Facebook is invading our privacy, yet you're the one sharing willfully what it is that moves you, what it is that you had for breakfast, the fact that you're at the gym, what you had for lunch. We are the last generation to know privacy as it was. If you think about that for a second, that's transformative, that's powerful, and so each and every one of us have this opportunity and obligation to sort of help those around us. Because now privacy, think about this, for our children and our children's children, privacy is something that's gonna have to be taught now. What you share online, imagine, there is no such thing now as common sense. But do you really want privacy? I'd argue that part of the beauty and magic of socialized media is the ability to sort of earn a reaction, to earn a response, right? Isn't that why you tweet? Because you wanna see what someone says about your thoughts? You share your ideas through blog posts because they're yours and you wanna see how the community embraces them or takes them further. But I would say this, who you are today and who you are tomorrow might be coming to a crossroads soon because there's this idea of the brand you and this brand that you have to represent. There's this famous saying, everyone has uh, three lives, a public life, a private life, and a secret life. And which one are you broadcasting? Which one do you want to broadcast? If someone were to search Twitter or search Facebook or search Google, what is it that you would want to be defined by those search results? How is it that you would want to be viewed? What is it that you would want to paint in terms of that portrait when you're not there to explain yourself to those results? I believe that social media is actually an earned privilege. Just because we have the right to tweet or the ability to update our status in Facebook doesn't necessarily mean that anyone is going to give a shit about what you're thinking or saying. That's trivial, right? Anyone can do that. You, in this room, you guys are the ones defining the future of all of this. You're the ones who have forced innovation in all of these tools. Many of you have created them. It's changed my life. It's changed your life. It's changing everyone's life. This is a privilege. It's much more than these conversations. And this is why I spend a lot of my time now sort of just trying to be a wannabe social scientist, studying anthropology and sociology and psychology. Because social media is about this, it's driven by this, it's rich with emotion. That's why there's a me in all of this. The me in social media is powerful because you are at the center of the experiences that you define, right? Who you connect with, who you follow, what you read. Your stream is your experience. It's you are your own curator. Everyone is their own curator. It's having an, quite an amazing impact. I'll share a little secret with you. I am an introvert. I have a really hard time getting in front of people. I have a really hard time going to tweet ups and social networking events. But I will say this, that social media, Twitter, Facebook, you name it, has sort of helped me become this idea of a digital extrovert. Because of those reactions that we earn on Twitter, when we get new connections, friend requests, what have you, tags, each one of those gives me a little bit more confidence to sort of step off, off online into the real world. And I would imagine that that has to be true for every one of us. We're defining a whole new era of society because of this, right? With each boost of confidence that we earn, we're changing the world, right? We're changing who we connect with, what we share. We're bringing hashtags into the real world as a gang sign. <laughs> one more time. <laughs> There's already studies that show that Twitter is making the world a much smaller place, that the distance between any two people is now only four degrees, and some studies show that it's only three degrees. But how we connect with individuals is actually changing, and Twitter and Facebook have already recognized this, and they're going to monetize it. And this might even be the future social network in terms of how you connect. If you have 100,000 followers, 
not everybody's following you for the same reason. And when you talk about a particular subject, let's just say Gnomedex, together we are one human network. But when we talk about football or gyms or Subway sandwiches, our networks start to fragment. We're starting to build this idea of contextual networks, or what I call niche works. And Twitter's recognizing, through their promoted tweet program, that when you talk about coffee, you will see a Starbucks ad. If you talk about flights, or Vancouver, or what have you, you'll see an ad from Virgin America. And they're recognizing that people are connecting around keywords and topics, and they're forming these micro-networks. And that's why in the future of the web, context becomes king. It's what makes something relevant. So now we are building these contextual networks, which is sort of the future of social networking. And they're different across the board. Depending on the subject that you talk about, they form this idea of relations versus relationships, right? Everybody talks about how social media is about relationships, but I don't see myself sending birthday cards to every single one I'm connected to. I don't check in with every single person individually. But I do check in with the idea of those that I'm connected with. And so I think we're also grooming this idea of relations over relationships. How many of you guys heard about the Dunbar number in anthropology? Right? I think it's estimated at somewhere between 130 and 150 people we can maintain a relationship with. Do you know that the average person on Facebook has 130 connections? But I believe what I call social graph theory, because we are learning this idea of digital confidence, if you will, that each and every year, that number, I believe, will double because we're starting to grow our networks contextually because we're curating our own experience. We're connecting with those people who we know, but also those who we don't know, would like to know, admire, respect, want to learn from. And so this is where things become really important because how we connect online, what we share online, is sort of equating to this idea of social currency, how you behave, who you talk to, who you reply to. People expect to sort of be acknowledged and recognized. And this whole concept of like. <laughs> is changing us, right? And so we're earning this idea of this reputation, this trust, these relationships. They're earned through our actions and words, right? How many of you guys use a service called Quitter? Right? Doesn't that just suck <laughs> when someone unfollows you? Damn it. But it teaches us something, right? Again, it's altruism versus self-actualization. Just because you have the ability to tweet doesn't make it interesting, right? I follow you for a reason, and I want to be reinforced to continue to follow you for that reason. And this box says everything about you, and it sometimes it comes at odds who you are as an individual, of what you might say or what you might share with your friends, yet your business acquaintances and your clients or your bosses are still connected to you in the same networks. But now there's a credit score for the fucking web. <laughs> right? Like, I can, now I can look at your username to see sort of where you measure online. And it's a great thing, absolutely, but don't get me wrong, how is this going to affect our sisters and our brothers and their kids? They don't have any idea of what clout influence means. But it's happening. Google is adapting its PageRank technology for when it displays real-time tweets based on your authority, based on your influence. It can't possibly channel everything that's being discussed. So it's going to start ranking them based on your stature. And that's changing everything. This saying is dead. You now are in control of how long people know you, people talk about you, people follow you. You define your own idea of celebrity. You define your own idea of relevance and how people perceive you and how many people follow you. This is now an era. I swear that looks exactly like this right now. <laughs> You are not just connecting with individuals anymore, right? How many of you are live tweeting, right? This is an audience with an audience with an audience. And for those companies or media properties or brands who are trying to connect with, with social media influencers or just anyone in general, you're connecting with people who are curating their experience. You're not just connecting with them. They have a responsibility to the people that are following them to continue to earn those relationships. 
So now when you try to connect with somebody, you have to think about what's in it for them because they know they're being rewarded for this. It's not only clout. There's several services that are starting to rack, you know, rank us, how we are on Facebook, how we are on Twitter, our blogs, etc. And it's rewarded. How many of you heard about the Virgin America thing with clout? Influencers got free flights. Starbucks. Influencers got free cups of coffee. Not that that's a, a reward, but they did. <laughs> <laughs> but this isn't a popularity contest, right? This is about meaning. This is about substance. This is about collaboration and co-creation. I'm sorry if any of you participated in this. I don't want to insult you. But if you've heard about the Fast Company Influence Project, it's not influence, right? It's just popularity. This is going around the whole web. Please vote for me so I can be in the Fast Company Top 100 so I can show the world just how influential I am. You are more influential than you know, and you don't need that contest to prove it. This is influence. Well, Alyssa Milano is part of it. My good friend Stowe Boyd is someone whom I, I greatly admire. And he talks about, with all of the discussions of Twitter and Facebook and how it's changing the world, that one thing we have to keep in mind is that we make it come alive. We make it rock. You make it rock. That's why I go there every day. You're the ones who set the new trends each and every minute. You have the ability to take this guy and turn him into this guy. <laughs> I'm on a horse. <laughs> this is influence in action. When the United Nations wanted to raise awareness for end malaria, or for ending malaria. It went to you and me, and also some of the media elite, but it went to regular people to make a difference through Twitter, through Facebook, through blogs, through YouTube. And they were able to raise a ton of bed nets to help save lives in Africa. This is becoming a social science, and this is why I'm trying to study this as much as I can. Did you know that in the social web, the majority of users are women. Chicks rule. And did you know that if you were to use clout, I, re I recently ran a study about the influence between men and women on Twitter, that of the top 50,000 influential individuals, men have just a slight edge. But when you look at the millions of people on Twitter, women are the most influential. And you can also measure just how influential a person is, not by how many votes they get for Fast Company, but how long something stays alive in the stream. And think about that. How many of you use TweetDeck or Seismic or some tool to aggregate all your tweets? Yeah, that's your attention dashboard, right? And what does it take for you to click away from it? It's got to be something pretty compelling, something pretty substantial. And in order to keep something alive in the stream, we call it resonance. That's going to be driven by influence. My good friend Dan Zarell has already studied about if you want to get retweeted, here's the one to do it. <laughs> it's down to a science. He also has the, the, the most retweeted words, the most retweeted sentence structures. I mean, this is how scientific it's becoming. He also has it for Facebook. Saturday is the most popular day for sharing, by the way. So all of these tools before us, what does it mean, right? I think it means that this is an opportunity. I think it's like Chris was saying here, it's about you. But it's not about finding yourself. I mean, what does that mean, right? You now have the ability to create this presence, this persona, to open doors based on how it is that you interact, who you connect with, and how you share online. Life is about creating yourself. And this has never really been more true or truer than today. And so as such, we need to sort of take this responsibility for ourselves and for those who we're connected to, to increase our digital footprint. For all those Matrix fans, you are the architect. <laughs> or for, influ uh, for Inception fans, you are the architect. <laughs> Same thing. So now, 
we not only live in public, but we love in public. And how we connect with each one of us, and as individuals, as peers, is sort of a real big opportunity for us to define not only who we are today, but who we are tomorrow, and the difference that sort of we can make in everything that we do. It's not just about causes, right? It's about our profession. It's about our personal relationships. It's about who we are, what we discover, what we share, what we learn, what we choose to learn. We're in control of all of this now. And more importantly, people are connected to you because of what you're sharing. That's tremendous. That's special. That's a privilege. As Chris shared with you, the idea is that Gnomedex was about to him and to you. This is also what it is for me. These are the things that I hope each one of us walk away with to help others understand. That not only can you lead, but you can also keep learning. Anyone who says that they're a social media expert is fucking lying to you. <laughs> We're forever students but we can still share what we're learning. So please, do us all a favor and keep Gnomedex alive in all that you do. Thank you. I, yeah, should I take questions? Does anybody have any questions? No, all right. <laughs> yeah, of course. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Brian.